Alrighty, thank you everybody, welcome. My name is Paul English and I'm going to talk about why open source is critical for platform firmware. Uh, first of all, traditional who am I? Uh, I've been working with and playing with Linux and open source since about 1994. Uh, most of my career I've been a professional system admin, DevOps, SRE type person. Um, more recently, um, I co-founded PreOS Security with uh, Lee over there, who's made these uh, <laughs> handouts, among other things, and working in the platform security space. Uh, Lee's really kind of more the person that's more knowledgeable in that space. I'm more trying to do all the other businessy stuff. Um, but that's, that's the motivation for this talk and my, my background um, more recently. And uh, if, if you want my contact info, there you are. Uh, so what am I talking about? First of all, I'm going to say what I'm not talking about, mostly. Um, so mostly what I'm not talking about in this talk is embedded operating systems. And there's a reason for that, I'll get into that. Um, so for example, your Linux Wi-Fi, you know, your Wi-Fi router running DDWRT, your little IoT device running a full-blown uh, Linux, and so on. Um, I'm going to try and steer clear of that topic matter um, and focus on uh, what I'm, gonna, what I'm defining as platform firmware is actually not really a, a good term for it because platform firmware is fairly tied to the UEFI and BIOS space, but I want to talk about a little bit more broadly than that. I'm also not talking about Android and iOS. Um, it's important enough that I feel it's even worth a whole slide on why I'm not talking about those things. Um, for one thing, they're worth a talk on their own. Um, for another thing, uh, embedded OSs are, in my opinion, in generally in a much better place. Um, than platform firmware. Um, and part of the reason is that they're a lot more visible to everybody, consumers, industry, and so on. Uh, and part of the reason is it's actually, in, in a lot of cases, uh, if you've got an embedded uh, CPU uh, that's powerful enough to run Linux, um, then that is often what is done um, because it's free and it's open source, all the good reasons you would want to run open source. Um, so it's more visible to everybody all up and down the chain. Um, there have been very high profile incidents of non-compliance with the GPL in that space. Um, for example, people making uh, DVD players that embed Linux in there. Um, and so they're, they're happily using uh, Linux because it's open source and it helps them get their product out the door faster and cheaper and better. Um, but then they don't turn around and release the source code as they're required to do by the GPL. They get caught, they get uh, taken to court and they lose. That seems to be working pretty well as these things go, um, but the advantages of open source are still great. They have the option to use um, some of the BSDs and not, uh, use the, um, not use GPL code, and often they do. Um, so, uh, and that works as it is supposed to work. So, <laughs> you know, you can, you can have your, you can have your BSD license stuff and, and all the benefits of that without contributing back, or you can have GPL it's out there, it works, and, and people, uh, I think even down to the, you know, down to the consumer, people know, uh, broadly know about open source in that space, at least if they're paying any attention to it at all. Um, it probably is worth going back and mentioning, you know, of course, Android is uh, open core, um, if you will, the Linux that runs underneath it is open source, and Google has been very, I think, very, very good about re-releasing that as open source, but they've been pulling as much feature and functionality out of that and into the proprietary level. Yes, sir? One of the reasons Google's doing that is because vendors aren't passing along updates, so they're trying to centralize everything into their specific store app and communicate through that, which they do control. Right, for. right. Um, and the, but to be fair to Google, the, I mean, pro and con, they also have been working very, very hard to push uh, the hardware level updates, and it's a very, very tough problem. I actually, I, I wish I had a reference to a good talk on that, like because, because Qualcomm and the, the vendors that provide the SOCs are trying to keep stuff proprietary, lots of binary blobs at that level. And so supporting, you know, supporting a given phone, for example, for years and years and years and continuing to provide updates is very hard. Uh, and effectively, uh, it's not necessarily that Google wants you to throw away your phone and buy a new phone. Um, maybe, maybe Apple does, but it's not necessarily the case that Google wants that. Um, but, it's, but, but maybe Qualcomm does, and they're pushing it from their end. <laughs> so. For example, the ISPs for Carriers, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of players with a lot of stake in you getting new hardware all the time, unfortunately. Um, but 
to be fair to Google, I think they've done a, a bit of a better job of giving back, and at least at, with regards <coughs> to their requirements for open source, and maybe a bit, slightly better job than Apple of, of supporting hardware longer, um, at least trying to do a better job of that. It's actually, it's a really hard problem. Um, iOS, I, I could be wrong. Maybe somebody knows better than I do. I think it may be BSD based, um, like, um, like uh, Mac OS itself, uh, ultimately. But again, that means that they don't have to contribute anything back at all. Um, but that's, that's, that is the freedom of open source. So they're allowed to do that, and, and they do, and, it's, and it works. Um, but like I said, there's, there's some good reasons to put all of that outside of the scope of this talk. <laughs> so two, two longish slides talking about what I'm not going to talk about. So let's focus on what I'm really talking about. Um, this one's a little dense now that I look at it on the projector. Um, so I'm going to try and focus on almost entirely on the things that are not quite operating systems that work on microcontrollers, um, which is almost everything on any composed system that you have, laptop, desktop, smartphone, you name it. Um, so every USB device uh, down to your base, most basic thumb drive has a microcontroller in it, and it has firmware on it. Um, Believe it or not, there's actually a, a standardized mechanism for pushing updates to that firmware. <laughs> I only just learned that recently as I was prepping for this talk. It's kind of, kind of crazy. Unfortunately, many USB devices don't support it, but there is a standard out there. Um, every PCI device, every Thunderbolt device, and every NVMe device, those are basically all variants, or, or PCI plus, if you will, um, has, has at least one firmware um, to communicate with the system. Um, as well, and often more. Uh, the, the main one that you'll hear more about is the option ROM, and that's part of the booting process for initializing the PCI device and so on. Um, but usually any PCI device with any level of complexity, for example, an NVMe device, is for storage. So it not only needs to talk, have some firmware to talk to the main system, but it also has to do a whole lot of internal housekeeping. Um, you know, what blocks are allocated, what aren't, where leveling, and so on. Um, so that's. So more broadly speaking, any storage device, any networking device, um, they're going to have firmware on there of some sort. The more sophisticated the device is, for example, a RAID controller or one of these uh, network controllers that offload a bunch of um, TCP, uh, the more complex that firmware is up to the point where I'm pretty sure a bunch of the RAID controllers have full-blown Linux on there as well. And um, you know, a sufficiently powerful CPU on there that you can run a full-blown Linux. Um, I've definitely encountered RAID cards where you can plug the RAID card into the network. It has its own network interface, <laughs> and you can talk to a little web server on the RAID card to deal with it. Um, uh, Super I.O. is a very invisible thing these days, but that's a, a thing that's been around since the days of parallel and serial ports. Um, and that's just another, another little chip or often integrated with other chips on your computer that, again, runs firmware to talk to your keyboard and fans and so on. Um, your processor itself, of course, these days, they're very, very, very complex and often have many additional processors inside of your processor. Um, but the processor itself, the main core processor that does most of the work, um, can be effectively reprogrammed via microcode, which I'm going to call another form of firmware. Um, your first talk, uh, yes, uh, if you were in the previous talk, um, the, entire, the entire track, it looks like today, is all about firmware in this, in this room. Uh, but if you were attended the previous talk, that was all about UEFI. Um, I, think I, was, I think it was mentioned that BIOS is effectively deprecated, and it pretty much is. Um, ACPI is, is another uh, standard for managing power, um, and that's also very tie closely tied to UEFI. Um, I think I already covered PCI option ROMs well enough. Um, some notable exceptions. Um, BMC code, uh, which uh, Lee will be giving a talk on later today. Please do attend that talk. <laughs> Um, so this is, this is a, a computer within your computer to manage your computer. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Intel actually ships, uh, Intel and AMD both ship some variant of this cooked into processors themselves. Uh, in Intel's case it's called AMT, in AMD's case it's called PSP. Um, that's sort of the, the lower end consumer version or maybe um, enterprise desktop fleet version. On servers it's usually called a base, baseboard management controller. You might also see it called IPMI. Um, or ILOM, Integrated Lights Out Management. Uh, this basically lets you do power on, power off on your computer uh, remotely via a different network interface and effectively a different computer. So as long as there's power to that other computer, it can power on <laughs> and off your main computer. So obviously if you yank the power cord um, from your computer, the BMC also can't do anything. 
But in the case of a laptop with Intel AMT technology on it, as long as it's got a battery, you know, that, and, that, and it's connected to the network, um, which, uh, which could even be Wi-Fi, potentially, um, it can be managed out of band by this whole other computer that's running Linux, um, usually. <laughs> um, and uh, we've got Intel, uh, AMT, ME and AMT, I kind of got ahead of myself. Um, it came out, it, I, Intel did not make this public per se, but it became public when, the, uh, AM, when there was a vulnerability in ME and AM, uh, in I think AMT was when this became public that, uh, that that is actually a processor inside your processor running a full-blown version of Minix, which again is not GPL licensed, so um, they're fairly free to use that without re-releasing the code. Um, I'm guessing uh, that AMD PSP also works the same way and is, pr and is, uh, is also running some variant um, of <laughs> a full-blown operating system, but I, I can't confirm that. Any questions? This is a lot of technical stuff. This is mostly a non-technical talk and mostly a propaganda talk for open source. <laughs> yes, go ahead. I don't no, no. I think I think from from Intel and AMD's perspective, um, these are valuable add-ons. They were valuable in the server space for years and years before they started baking them into the processor, and they saw it as a way to get a, a value add, of, you know, um, that um, that would give them an edge over you know Intel over AMD and vice versa, or AMD had to add it because Intel had already added it. However, you want to look at it there. Is that why they're closed sourcing because they're afraid of their competitors? Um, I will get into that. That's more or less the substance of the entire talk. <laughs> um, and I have, I have some opinions on that, which I will, I will share, and I'm, I'm definitely interested in, in other reasons. So I, I wouldn't say that DRM is not a factor, right? Obviously, you can, like, if, you, if you're going to try and do DRM, then you have to keep, you have to, you can't be releasing the, the code that does the DRM open source, because now you have to step no more DRM, right? Um, that's I agree, and that's but that's a different talk. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so I'm sure that that's a factor. Um, but as far as I know, most of what AMT does is about managing the computer more so than enabling DRM. Um, ditto for AMD PSP, and and at least sort of in the business sense, I can see why they would have added it pre only for that. And you know, um, if it also enables DRM, that that's its own. That's an additional problem, I would say, <laughs> in the whole space. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I came in late. Uh, you said not real-time operating systems. And uh, oh, not. in terms of what I was not talking about. So um, not, I'm trying to avoid talking about uh, things that are relatively more powerful processes that are run, running full operating systems of any sort, okay. because securing operating systems itself is actually a very well-covered space. Um, and there are whole dedicated talks about that. Um, like. Securing IoT, you can run IoT stuff on a super uh, lightweight microcontroller that can that can talk to the network maybe or does its own serial protocol and cannot run. It's just too uh, low powered to run a full blown operating system. And there's a good case for doing that with IoT. For example, you need a sensor that that needs to run off a coin cell. Um, but in in many cases nowadays, IoT means a full blown Linux on a fairly powerful microprocessor. Uh, maybe running off of mains power or running off of a, a smartphone battery that will last for quite a long time um, for a processor that powerful running full-blown Linux. So with, with Linux, you've got multitasking, you've got multi-users, you've got um, almost invariably the possibility of doing uh, very powerful crypto. Um, so for, for signing for updates, for communication, and so on. The, the, lower, the lower power processors do not, often do not have those abilities. Um, so, and the RTOS is like um, QNX is the one that comes to mind and so on. In general, those support similar things to, uh, to Linux. Um, I'm just less familiar with them as well. <laughs> so, um, but that's why I'm not, that's why I'm sort of separating the content of the talk. Um, and, and partly, uh, other people are more knowledgeable and smarter than me about operating. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll backtrack there. I'm actually significantly less informed about how to do <laughs> things well and securely with uh, low power microprocessors. I'm not a firmware engineer by, by background, like, but I know, I know plenty about securing Linux, full blown Linux systems and that still, that still works on a Raspberry Pi or even you know, something <laughs> less powerful as long as it runs Linux or some other operating system. <laughs>
Um, okay, so why open source? Um, I'm preaching to the choir here. You're all here at the open source uh, conference. Um, I'm probably missing some very key things here because I, you know, I was just like, I just need a quick slide to get that out. Uh, freedom, obviously, uh, power of empowerment of the individual and the user, um, the customer. Uh, <laughs> uh, customization, so power in the form of customization, power in the form of flexibility, transparency, uh, quality, overall quality. Many eyes make bugs shallow. Um, I feel, I feel the need to say a bit more about that. Um, there was a lot that came out with Heartbleed um, about how oh, we've got open source SSL and you know here's all these deep problems with it. And you know how, how did open source not just fix this problem by being open source? Surely everybody, <laughs> almost everybody, everybody who uses any uh, open source in the world uses open SSL. Um, and you know why? Why was why was that up, why was that not fixed because it was open source? Um, but that I think that's a, a bit of a straw man argument. I think that the issues there were uh, also endemic and open source. But making having had open open SSL be proprietary um, would not have fixed any of those issues. It could just as easily have been infiltrated by somebody or maintained by too few people who weren't paid well enough, um, etc. So. In general, I think that that assertion stands. The more the more people at least can see this, the code. The simple fact is, if you have closed source code and people can't see it, then they cannot look at it. Um, if you've got open source code and people aren't looking at it, well, that's a different problem uh, in my mind. So many, many more. Finally, of course, given my own personal drive, uh, security. And um, I just want to really emphasize here that security bugs are just a subset of bugs. So when you're talking about code quality, um, You've got all the different aspects of quality with code, um, in, including like, does it crash when you try to run it? Um, or even user interface, does, you know, is the user interface functional and friendly and so on? Um, all of these are quality issues. You can have a, in my opinion, you can have something that you would call a bug when the user interface is simply confusing. Um, but as far as security goes, um, you can also have user interface bugs that are simply confusing in such a way that it reduces security. That's a security bug in my, in my book. Um, we should be doing bug bounties for those. <laughs> side, side topic. Um, if we start to look at security bugs, though, um, in, and, and focus on firmware a little bit, um, you can obviously have a security bug directly in your firmware. So this is the code that's running on some little microcontroller somewhere in your system or on your thumb drive, for example. Um, so one example of that would be that the update mechanism allows unsigned updates. So you can push any code you want into the into the microcontroller, and now it is doing literally whatever you want. Uh, there are there are some very high profile examples of this happening. Um, a good one might be to look at the NSA. Um, they pushed updates into hard drive firmware, and now that hard drive can either corrupt data or exfiltrate data, literally as you're reading or writing uh, from the hard drive, and otherwise present as if it's doing its thing normally. Um, so that's a, a great little example of of that. Um, so, this is tricky. Uh, many of these processors, these little processors, are so so weak, <laughs> sort of so low powered. Um, you know, we're talking about cryptographic signing and hashing and so forth. Those operations can take a very long time on this kind of power processor. Um, so, you know, how 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 acceptable is it to say, okay, we need to upgrade the update the firmware on your um, you know, on your keyboard controller, uh, but the whole system is going to be just doing nothing for like ten minutes while we, while we make sure that the uh, the hash is, is correct. <laughs> um, yes. In terms of really small devices like that, I think it might be small enough that you could mathematically prove that the firmware on that device is accurate and just put it into hard ROM. Uh, yes. Yes. So ideally, in a lot of cases, it would be uh, it would be in a uh, well. If you put it in hard ROM, now you can't now you can't fix problems if there are problems. So that's that's the trade off there. And and the in terms of these components, the the ability to do a rewritable ROM um, is getting cheaper and cheaper to do more and more. So it starts to become very motivating to to be able to update it in the field without having to sort of send the whole thing back to the manufacturer and or hook up to the JTAG uh, port on the device itself. I'm saying it should yeah. even have JTAG, just hard ROM. Uh, I'll get into that. I'll get into that a little bit more later too. There's uh, so uh, 
So as a practical matter, you basically, the manufacturers have to put that stuff in there just to do quality testing during manufacture. Obviously, you can make them less accessible later on, and by the time you've glued a smartphone together with, with glue, like, the <laughs> that stuff becomes more difficult. But your, your point is solid, um, it's just not practical. And those ports can be handy, I'll get into that later too. Um, so, uh, but back on to security bugs, uh, another, so, uh, uh, Vincent over there, <laughs> who's talking later, has, I think, done some work on uh, um, categorization of firmware bugs. Um, and there's some great talks from the UEFI Plug Fest on this. Um, but this is just a couple of sort of examples for you to think about, not an attempt, attempt to do a whole taxonomy. So another one would be side effects of or adjacent to firmware. So Spectre and Meltdown were side effects of hardware features. Uh, as far as I know, there was no direct firmware component involved where it was software written running on a microcontroller um, that in turn caused spectrum meltdown. These were, these were baked into the actual silicon of the, the processors that were gonna do this branch prediction stuff and, and sometimes it didn't work quite the right way. <laughs> um, but they could be partially addressed with microcode updates. Um, so microcode is, is firmware that does tell the main processor how to operate um, and I'm hand waving a bit here, I'm a little bit daunted by some of the experts in the room, but um, but it's adjacent to firmware, and and you could you could mitigate it with firmware. So that's not a firmware bug, but also a security bug that that uh, that interacts with firmware quite tightly. Um, there's also sort of a co-option of features. Um, for example, the AMT thing was I think a, a, an issue of a default remote password, a remotely accessible password. So that's a very basic general type of security bug. Of course. That is, I, I will note, that is the full-blown OS um, running Minix, so. Um, and if it feels like I'm picking on Intel too much, this is across the board, and I've got some real kudos for Intel later on in the talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, what do we do for firmware or, uh, remember, software bugs? Um, we do all the same stuff, uh, ideally. So um, the, the key point here is that all the stuff that you would want to do to mitigate software bugs in firmware software um, is, is facilitated by having open source and hampered by not having open source. Um, static analysis uh, requires you to have the source code. Dynamic analysis, um, in the case of firmware, and this kind of gets back to your, your point about the JTAG ports, um, how do you do dynamic analysis on a microprocessor that's like buried way down deep in your system? No, I wasn't saying yeah. to not have a JTAG period. I was just saying not have programmable wrong. On it. Fair enough. That's yeah, <laughs> two di distinct port, two distinct uh, uh, issues. But uh, so that would be so dynamic analysis. You can you can do that more much more easily if you've got a JTAG port um, or or whatever I two C the other uh, protocols that you can use. Um, uh, testing and unit integration, this is something the manufacturer has to do. They have to ensure that they sell you something that actually works at all. Um, so uh, again, the uh, JTAG ports are useful for that. Being able to reflash the ROM is also gets to be useful in these cases as well. Um, uh, reproducible builds, the Debian project has been working very, very hard on this. Um, I'm not aware of a similar effort in the uh, Ubuntu land, but it is a hard problem. Um, but if you, if you want a reproducible build, you have to have the source code to start out with. <laughs> um, so you have to be able to verify that when you compile it, it produces the same thing as the thing that you were given as a binary. Um, and then standards uh, compliance. So the software engineering world has, has all these glorious standards organizations that do really, really, really hard work um, uh, on developing really good standards for this stuff. NIST has, NIST has standards for firmware. Um, that and so uh, being able to comply with those or ensure compliance with those again if you've got the code you can do that much more easily so one slide summary of my talk my main reason for open source being critical for platform security is, uh, platform firmware is security um, there are all the other reasons also apply but security makes it to me a critical issue um, if you want to get a little bit more specific about it, we can say supply chain security. Um, I, I can't, I don't think I can even say that without mentioning that I think that, at least in my opinion, the Bloomberg uh, story was perhaps 
uh, not <laughs> not all that true, or at least not very verifiably true. Um, but the premise stands, and I think all the security experts I've watched talk about it that I trust a lot more than myself, um, you know, say it's very likely that, that um, nation state actors are trying to do supply chain attacks, uh, have succeeded in doing them. Uh, we certainly have examples of the NSA doing interdiction with Cisco routers and so on. Um, so, so how do you deal with this problem? Um, so this is a fantastic talk by, um, by Andrew Bunny Wong, who's one of the, one of the one, a, who is actually an expert in this area of kind of uh, software development and so forth. Um, and his quote about it is, while an open source hardware phone is arguably more trustable than a closed source one, open source is necessary but not sufficient for it to be trusted. Um, so so in, in a way, the whole point of my talk that uh, open source is critical for <laughs> uh, platform firmware security is it is critical, but it is also not sufficient. Um, and obviously when you start talking about trust and security, you, you can start thinking about your threat model, but the reality is uh, at the end of the day, everybody is, is trusting their computing devices to some degree or another. And it may be that there's no nation state interested in, in specifically taking money out of your bank account. Um, but for sure, if you happen to have money in your bank account, there's somebody out there in the world that's interested in doing that. So I'm not gonna talk about threat modeling here. I'm just gonna say it benefits everybody in the world um, to be able to trust their computing devices uh, more rather than less. Um, so broad overview of the problem. Uh, modern systems have up to 200 firmware blobs. I never did find a good citation for that. <laughs> I can't count how many ones I've seen without a good citation of, uh, here's the list. Um, so the system itself has all of these firmware blobs, but anything you plug into it also has those firmware blobs. So there's, a, there's a hack for Dell monitors out there uh, that attacks the firmware in the monitor. <laughs> um, I forget the name of it. Monitor Darkly. Monitor Darkly, that's right, thank you. Does you attack the USB hub that's built into it? The on-screen display. I th yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, that's some, <laughs> some pretty devious stuff. Pretty cool, <laughs> um, so uh, I do have a, a hands-on exercise if you would care to do it. Um, if so, if you'd like to do it, um, no, you don't have to, and I will demonstrate it on this computer since I got the right computer hooked up. Uh, boot up into Linux. Uh, okay. So that was the problem. The problem is getting worse. Uh, Dennard scaling and Moore's law are, are effectively over or on their way um, to being over. So the question is, if we can't keep getting more and more transistors on a processor or, and, or, and or clocking it faster, um, how do we make things faster? Uh, how do we make my computer faster? <laughs> um, how do we make people throw away their old computer and buy a new computer <laughs> in, <laughs> in this uh, world of throwaway things? Um, so the uh, so one answer, one potential answer. There's there's other creative ones, quantum computing being one of them. But one potential answer is well, let's take work off the CPU, and add other smaller processors. Um, I did see a great thing about this. Unfortunately, I don't have the reference. Um, but how that there was a sort of curve of that happening where, um, in the early, very very early days of computers, that was very very common, before my time, uh, and it became significantly less common as CPUs became much more powerful. And then it started becoming common again as we started adding, uh, especially gaming and graphics cards, but more and more as it, uh, the, in my mind, as uh, those additional microcontrollers became very, very, very cheap uh, to add. So for a while it was like you put all your money into the main CPU and just have it do everything because it's so insanely powerful. Um, but then as, as microcontrollers start getting really, really cheap, it's like, why not throw a few microcontrollers over here and over here and over here? <laughs> Yes. And don't forget FPGAs are taking over some of that space. Yes, the it's world of FPGAs is wild right fast. now. Yeah. Fixed point only though. Uh, sure. When, when I was in college, FPGAs were just insanely expensive and insanely slow. Yeah. But now you've got an FPGA and it's very, very powerful. And it's a, and why not have it also have a very powerful ARM processor next to it, like right close to it, so you can do general purpose computing or your FPGA. That's crazy, and awesome. Um, it's awesome, but it is increasing this problem, right? So if we were had 200 microcontrollers on your system right now, maybe in a few years it'll be 300. Um, and even if I manage to convince every firmware engineer in the world that they should be pushing their, you know, pushing open source, uh, 
Um, you know, there's a sort of uh, balancing thing going on there. And obviously, I'm not speaking to firmware engineers here for the most part. Um, it is debatable if this will work well. Um, but on, on the FPGA topic, as well as, as, well as this whole topic, uh, <coughs> this is a very good read, ACM uh, article called The New Golden Age for Computer Architecture. Um, there is at least, an, at least one ACM paper um, which, which uh, fairly strongly, uh, I think sort of mathematically, um, I didn't actually read that paper, um, tries to prove that, it's, that this will not work. Like you can't just keep throwing microprocessors at the problem to, to offload your main processor and expect things to go faster because you always end up adding bottlenecks while you're doing it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, whether, or not, whether or not it will help matters, it is happening. And microcontrollers are cheap and they're not getting any more expensive. So, so ready for the exercise? Here we go. <laughs> um, so um, little CUDA, a little sort of self-promotion uh, there. Uh, Lee has... Uh, uh, worked very hard on this program called uh, firmware audit that we've that we've come up with basically most of what it does is run these sorts of commands to uh, try and identify different firmwares on your system and hash information about them so you can get a before and after comparison because for most of them we don't have source code um, I would say all of them on any given system I've touched <laughs> so the best you can do is you're now dealing with binary blobs you can say well maybe I can maybe I can download that blob um, you know, for even for ones that don't necessarily have an update mechanism, you can you can often download it um, and then hash it and make sure it doesn't change on me. <laughs> so, um, hopefully, that it's what everyone else has for that hardware. Uh, correct, correct. You can go compare with other people. So, um, let's see. So, I would say that basically anything that you find as an entry. Um, in these, any any entry for list of USB devices, which often your system has them actually attached, physically attached, uh, is going to be running some firmware. Uh, same with most everything else you see here. Uh, and that didn't quite work as far as displaying it. There we go. Hey. <laughs> All right. Uh, so obviously, you've already uh, at least had the opportunity to hear about BIOS um, earlier. There will be more talks on uh, UEFI and BIOS and so on. Uh, well, that's not working very well. Uh, let's see. Uh, physical memory, uh, they, they don't have, as far as I know, memory does not usually have much, but it does still have a little chip on there that identifies the memory, if nothing else. Um, what were the options you ran? Uh, DMI decode, I just ran straight. Oh, so um, you were running the firmware uh, No, no. Um, no, I thought I'd run the commands raw. <laughs> uh, so that's let's see. Not too great. Um, I was hoping to kind of, oops. <laughs> See what I'm typing either. That might help. Let's see if less works a little better. There we go. Um, so I was hoping to find something that was maybe not something you would expect. So, so a lot of detail about the processor, the BIOS itself. Um, which it, none of that is very surprising. Um, I don't know what that USB device is, though. That's interesting. It was it there before? Uh, and H, uh, so HDMI, the sound, the sound card, of course, has its own firmware. Um, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I hope not, but that's the thing, right? I, there's, there's no inherent, yeah, there's no inherent reason that, that that I couldn't be getting attacked via that. So right. right now, I don't have anything physically plugged into USB on my on my machine. And this is what I see. Um, the root hub, it's not surprising. Uh, Synaptic sets my touchpad, um, which almost certainly is, well, it has to be running firmware of some sort. Uh, another root hub, two, yeah, 
looks like you've got Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and wired internet. Yes, that makes sense. Um, USB is more than fast enough for, for those devices, so why not? <laughs> um, so I will flip back to the thing. I think that's probably enough demo, live demo for me, but I will give you the, the view where you can do your own. Um, and it's definitely not... Uh, oh, no. Um, it's definitely not... Uh, in the scope of my talk to walk you through actually doing this stuff. Lee, uh, Lee and I have both given talks about um, sort of going through all this by hand, but that's not the drive of this one. I'll give you a moment with that one, especially if you want to take a picture. Uh, let's see. Raise your hand if you have any problems like you can help. Uh, sure, yeah. I think I need to speed up. I just have a question. So, um, so if in the future a system really does have, you know, say 300 firmwares on different microcontrollers, even if a manufacturer did open source all of them, wouldn't it still be really hard to take advantage of most of the benefits of open source? Like you couldn't easily, um, you know, do any sort of testing on it or static analysis even maybe because there'd be so many interconnecting components and like the board layout still wouldn't be open source. Correct, correct. I will get into that a little bit uh, in a little bit. Um, but yes, yeah, it, it's, a very, it's a very hard problem space compared to uh, sort of the open source of your operating system. But at the same time... Um, we have to get that we want to have an actual security. Right, a system that we can trust. And, right. and for example, the OpenBMC project, they're building up two new images to test their stuff with security testing. They can't test physical bare metal stuff, but they can do, they can test a lot of their software stack with QEMU and, and, and yeah. uh, static and source analysis yeah. there. But yes, uh, your, your point is solid. Like that, and that's, that gets back to what Bunny Wong was saying, is that, you know, even, well, even if the manufacturer, um, even if you could trust the manufacturer themselves 100%, that they wouldn't put any sort of bad or defective, even security bug hardware into your system in the first place that your firmware is running on, and even if you could then verify that the firmware is correct, the any given system is not just touched by the manufacturer themselves. Often the manufacturing itself is outsourced or com all the components <laughs> are like sub, sub, subbed out. Um, so any system that you receive is the composition of a ton of different components and so on, but also a massive supply chain <coughs> process where like tons and tons of people have opportunity to put their hands on it. So it is a very hard problem. Um, I'm hoping uh, Bunny, Bunny Huang said that he has some ideas. Bruce Schneier said that they have some ideas uh, on improving this whole thing. And, and honestly, I'm more of the open source would it be an improvement over closed source. Let's, let's just move towards better kind of opinion. <laughs> uh, go ahead. And also with the RISC-V uh, systems, it's possible to have more generic and still really cheap open source little microcontrollers right. to use in these devices and maybe migrate towards a more standard model for a basis for building these things. Uh, we're one slide away from that. <laughs> uh, I, this is an honorable mention here. Um, this, this talk is so worth watching. Um, uh, from B-Sides Portland last year. Um, this is what, or so Oracle very strongly is pushing this bare metal cloud. Um, other, everybody else is doing it too, but Oracle is doing it kind of at a earlier and, and bigger scale than, than most of the others. It's a kind of part of their competitive edge, I guess. Um, but this, this is how these engineers have solved it, and it, it's wild. Um, they basically build a custom little Arduino-based device that connects to every JTAG or I2C or whatever. The physical port on the chips for updating the chips physically connects to all of them, and, and just whenever they flip a customer so you know you can rent you can rent a bare metal computer for as, I think as little as 10 minutes um, so between customers <laughs> they basically just forcibly reflash all the binary um, which they've of course hashing at least um, uh, onto onto each of those firmwares uh, onto each of those chips every, between every single <laughs> every single customer uh, then they start running into problems like those chips weren't really built for that much reflashing <laughs> uh, and starts to be issues but uh, this is their solution, um, and obviously it only only works if you've got about a bajillion identical computers. Because as soon as you have to change anything, 
it's a nightmare. <laughs> uh, go so ahead. you mean literally like in production, like the yes. servers on their racks have Arduinos with stuff soldered to all the JTAG? Correct. That is exactly yeah. what they've done. It's wild. It's wild. The, the talk alone is just a head trip. Um, to me, anyway. <laughs> I'm a nerd. What can I say? All right. Um, so, what about hardware? Firmware is software, but very close to the hardware. Uh, open source hardware is also good, but also not sufficient. Um, and that gets to gets your, directly to your question there. Um, I'm not really a hardware guy. Watch Bunny's talk. Um, but a couple things that you might not think about if you're used to thinking about Linux and open source software in general. Uh, the hardware world is a, like a crazy different world from what you're used to. Um, profit margins on whole systems are very low. When you start getting into microcontrollers and little memory chips and, and components, transistors, capacitors, and so on, tiny, tiny, tiny fractions of pennies matter a big deal. If you can shave off just a few fractions of pennies, but across like hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of components, it really adds up. Um, Bunny, Bunny mentions uh, three to five percent margin is typical for a distributor. And he found a case where they, strong, they have very strong evidence that a distributor is mixing in, I think, 3% uh, defective parts, known, sort of known defective, or at least there were, I think, engineering samples, what have you. Either way, it was much cheaper for the distributor to source those parts and mix them in with the whole, with the whole process. Um, and as a result, they effectively double their profit margin. Like, that's crazy. But the net, the net effect way down the line is that the like 3 to 5% of the computers coming out of the whole process were defective. Um, but for the distributor, like, <laughs> they, they have a lot of leverage in the, in the whole process, and it's hard to even pin down who did the thing. So <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of motivation for this. Um, more on the more consumer end that you might be more familiar with, uh, you have to be very careful when you buy SD cards and USB drives. Uh, fakery is insanely, insanely popular. Um, am I down to one minute? Yeah. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold. I'll table that okay. you're done. <laughs> um, instruction set architectures. Um, so we're talking, still talking about hardware. RISC-V is just an instruction set architecture. It does not necessarily imply an open source processor at all. Uh, MIPS is now also open source. Uh, in, in much the same way, there's some different restrictions. This is pretty exciting. Um, but to me, the biggest thing there is that they're increasing the visibility of open source in the hardware space. And so as a result, in my opinion, of RISC-V being an open source architect, uh, instruction set, people are like, well, where's the open source processor? Um, there are closed source uh, RISC-V processors that you can buy more readily now, but uh, then you can buy open source RISC processors. But the simple fact that RISC-V itself is open source means that there is also a big drive for open sourcing the processors themselves. Um, but, for example, Western Digital said that they're going to switch to RISC-V for all of their embedded um, processors. Um, but as I don't expect or believe that those processors will be open source, but just the instruction set architecture, which is still a great thing. But <laughs> Actually, ahead. WD just uh, like a month ago, I think, open sourced their RISC processor. Their processor. Their okay. Well, that's great. Exactly. And I, I think that part of that is there's a, there's a relationship there. But just to, just to point out that the, the ISA itself does not necessarily fix the open source uh, processor issue, but, but it's, it's a great thing. Um, so okay, so now, now, I'm, now I'm definitely going to risk uh, offending some, some of the firmware people in the room. <laughs> um, just as a very hand-waving broad assertion, I think that there's not much proprietary value or differentiation in firmware code more often than not. Um, of course, uh, of course, the, the legal team and the, um, you know, the IP teams at the, at, the big, at the companies that are producing these might say otherwise. But to make my case, you know, when you buy a USB or a SATA or NVMe drive, like how different is it at the firmware level? How much do you even know about that? All the differentiations on macro features that are like very far separated from the firmware. Uh, at this point, do I care whether hey, I'm using AMD PSP or Intel AMT? I just don't. If I need that feature, I want it. And if the processor doesn't have it, then I don't buy that processor. <laughs> it's not a question of, you know, is there some feature in there that I, that I need or don't need. Um, uh, Tiano Core kind of makes, helps to make my point for me. Uh, UEFI is open core with uh, proprietary modules. Um, I think that since that, that open core has happened, the, the importance of third party uh, independent BIOS vendors has, has significantly decreased. Um, and their power in the industry, their size, their economic size, and so on. 
is that a bad thing? Well, it's bad for them, but I think it's good for the world. <laughs> um, uh, so if somebody can think of a counterexample, I'm going to ask you to think of it in your mind and, and truck along here because I'm already over time. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Uh, we do have some very good things here. Tiana Core is awesome, I think. Um, Intel has also uh, done a lot more than just uh, Tiana Core, but they're one of the big drivers behind Tiana Core. Uh, they've got audio firmware. They've got um, the Open Compute, I think, is mostly Facebook. Um, Open BMC and Core Boot and CBIOS, I think, are independent efforts. Um, I probably should have researched this side a little bit better, but I'm really rushed for time now. There's an Open SSD project. Um, I think that one's mostly dead. Yeah. Um, the, the thing is, microcontrollers are, in fact, cheap, even down to the retail level. You can buy your own microcontroller and do your own open source thing. Um, uh, <laughs> whole systems, there's a, there's a purism, I think, is the only current effort on that, um, making a, an open source top to bottom phone as much as possible. Um, but I don't think it's running an open source risk processor, for example. I think it's an ARM still. Um, uh, laptops, purism, and Novena both, both are working very hard in that, in that space. Um, and uh, I'm, I think Vincent's talk later today, definitely attend that. He's talking primarily about current and future open source efforts in the, um, in the firmware space. What about uh, open power? Uh, yes, completely forgot to mention it. Open power is also a great, a great thing in this space. Um, I'm going to skip over that since I've more or less covered it. Here's another thing that's well worth mentioning, uh, especially on the Linux space. I, I wish that this were also available for FreeBSD or, or the BSDs. Um, it's basically just one guy. So in, the, in terms of the open SSL problem, like more contributors on this project would be good and more eyeballs looking for bugs and so on would be good. Um, this guy has managed to pressure or encourage or whatever <laughs> a lot of manufacturers to commit to whole lines of their of their systems being fully supported for firmware updates under Linux. And that is fantastic. I mean, even just being able to enumerate all the firmwares is one thing, but being able to update them automatically with signed secure updates is incredible. Uh, Windows has their own effort for this, um, but in the open source world, this is a fantastic thing. Worth following his blog if you're at all interested. Um, and worth it's worth bugging anytime you buy something. It's worth bugging, the, bugging whoever's selling it to you and saying, hey, you know, <laughs> how about we how about we go and support these guys? If not, maybe I'll go buy something from somebody else. But why can't we have, uh, for example, a common uh, open source core for storage devices? Couldn't Seagate and Western Digital share a common core like all the PC manufacturers do with Tiana Core? I think that this is feasible. I don't think it's not unreasonable. Um, and I honestly, I really don't think that the difference between buying a Seagate and a Western Digital hard, hard drive will come down to some firmware feature. It's, it's almost always going to be about speed, capacity, and perceived reliability. <laughs> um, perceived or measured, if you will. Um, and really, I mean, how many times do we need to, does the world, I, that's another thing about open source that I forgot to list on the main slide, is like, we don't really need to rewrite the same algorithm a bajillion times as a world of people who write software. We don't need a bajillion erasure coding, checksum, where leveling algorithms out there. <laughs> we need a good one. Um, I think the same premise of don't roll your own crypto applies here. It's like, you know, let's, let's get good implementations. Maybe a few alternate ones are good, but why not have them be open source? There's nothing, there's no, as far as I know, there's literally no proprietary erasure coding, checksum, or where leveling algorithm that has any super secret sauce that provides any additional value that can be even sold. <laughs> I mean, Thomas is gonna is gonna fight me on this one. That's not this is definitely true. Um, but yeah, it's less true than it used to be. But okay, um, I'll take that. Like, like I'll take that. Quantum, for instance, <laughs> quantum's way of uh, accounting for problems in the platters was far ahead of everyone else. Um, this okay. Actually, I did have an exclusion for maybe DSP on the other side. Like, you know, if they, got, yeah. if they got a read error four times in a row, they'd just mark that whole thing bad and move all the data somewhere else. Whereas other drives would just be like, oh, I'll keep trying. Oh, I'll keep trying. Oh, and that's all your data. Too bad. Sure, but is that, <laughs> is no, that really an algorithm or a configuration no, really, parameter? <laughs> well, that, yeah. that, that was in the ACI, yeah. that, that was in there to do that. Right, it was that in there as an algorithm, but like you could make the case that an open source thing that was just like, 
do we do it this way, which is a fairly obvious thing, or do we do it the other way, which is also fairly obvious, or do we retry five times instead of four? Uh, I mean, the okay. retry is <laughs> interesting, but then marking everything in the boundary is bad as well, like knowing your knowing your hardware and doing that. But I don't think that's an actual thing anymore because everyone uses SSDs now. So. Well, even now. Well, SSDs will probably have a similar thing though. SSDs have the, the detect thing where if you write too many too right. many times in an area, you've got to give that area a rest. All right, I'm going to hammer through my last couple of slides. We're on call to action, so we really are almost done. And then open the floor, because I think it's now lunchtime and we're not back up against another talk. Is that fair? <laughs> okay, call to action number one. When you have purchasing power, use it. Um, I often end up talking to sysadmins who are purchasing thousands of systems, maybe. Um, that's a different kind of purchasing power than you walking into Best Buy and saying this one or this one. Um, but use what you've got. Um, Push for open source, push for security, increase security, push for verifiability. Um, so it may not be open source, but if it's a binary blob, at least give me a checksum. Um, and push for compliance with standards, like the, the lack of compliance with the firmware standards that are good and well published is incredible. <laughs> um, keep an eye on the space. Um, I'm not the best speaker here, and I'm not definitely not the best thinker here, but there are some great ones out there. Um, this is definitely not a comprehensive list, uh, just a few that I tossed together and, and uh, could easily fill up many, many slides with that. You know you know, I have these slides. I can just give you these slides. I'm trying to get close view here. Okay. So I can put it on our, our blog. All right, fine. Uh, <laughs> support, <laughs> uh, support vendors who are doing the right thing. Um, in, in my world, uh, the vendors that jumped on earlier and committed more heavily to the firmware update FWAPD, uh, Linux vendor, for, is, a, is a great place to start. Um, so uh, Lenovo, I, I think now a lot of the big manufacturers, Lenovo, HP, and Dell, I think are, are, are either all in or all in on their business lines with that. With that. Um, but support free, uh, free and open source software over proprietary, repairable over disposable. I can't even emphasize this enough. I mean, <laughs> this is, maybe this is my personal thing and you came here just because you care about open source, but they are definitely interrelated. Like you can't, you can't repair something you own effectively if you don't have the source code. Um, uh, responsive on these, uh, responsiveness on these issues, even if they, even if they're at least saying, "Hey, we're aware of this. We're working towards it." Intel is uh, again, uh, Vincent's talk later will probably cover this, but Intel is, is proactive on this. But they're a massive corporation with huge legal departments and and worrying about patents and and trademarks and proprietary IP and so forth. So there's a lot to get through there. But it's a question of are they are they trying to head in the right direction or not, um, and and some there are definitely a lot of manufacturers, especially of the cheaper low end consumer stuff, that are headed in the opposite direction. Yeah, we're going to use GPL code, but we're not going to contribute back. Um, you know, support the ones that are pointed in the right direction at least. Um, promising of software and firmware updates. This gets back to repairability, even if they're like, well, we just we just can't see our way to open sourcing it. But at least if we'll we'll support, you know, we'll be pushing updates and bug fixes, security fixes for for five years, ten years, whatever. Um, and uh, go with the track record. Uh, promises are one thing, but if you they've got a track record, that's great. And last but not least, as I mentioned before, um, these things are cheap. Go out, have some fun, make your own open source SSD. <laughs> um, Relatively speaking, these are cheap. Um, and now open floor until we get kicked out of the room, I guess. 